الله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين On behalf of Saudi Society of Blood Disorders I would like to welcome you to the series of hematology webinars uh, Tonight we are going to have a three eminent speaker and our topic for today will be about cancer associated thrombosis our speak, the first speaker for tonight is Professor Farjal Al-Gahbani, and she's going to talk about prevention of cancer-associated thrombosis. Dr. Farjal. Assalamu alaikum. You share my slide? Dr. Rathman, it's your slide. اي نعم دكتوره واضحه. اي طيب. السلام عليكم كل عام وانتم بخير ونبارك عليكم العشر جميعا. My topic is the prevention of cancer associated thrombosis. As all of us we know venous thromboembolism is highly prevalent complications of malignancy with emerging dynamic changes in the incidence, diagram, diagnosis and treatment paradigm. And in this lecture we will go over the current literature and to see if we can answer this question for prevention of cancer-induced thrombosis. First of all, we'll take a talk about facts about cancer-induced thrombosis, about the current prophylaxis. Can we use the inpatient, outpatient prophylaxis all the same? Can we predict who are at risk of a thrombosis? And is this is application will be applied for both inpatient and outpatient. What's the best type of anticoagulations with the current overwhelming of DUACs, a lot of types of low molecular uh, weight heparin? What is the optimal dose to prevent CAT? Then we will go take a home message. As we can see the cylinder, the outpatient prophylaxis is totally different than inpatient. And for inpatient, also surgery versus no surgery. And before I proceed, I would like to, to go over two cases. Uh, I saw it uh, last three weeks. The first one, he is my patient. He is 67 years old male, presented with a huge ascites, splenic lesion, diagnosed as diffuse large B cell lymphoma, started in our shop. He had excellent response. After the fifth cycle of chemotherapy, um, he had, um, at the same time, he had a huge ascites. We did for him a drainage. He was, the ascites, after investigation, we, we found it is lymphatic drainage injuries. Then he was in regular tabbing. Uh, almost three weeks ago, I received a call at night from his son. He said, my dad, he had sudden shortness of breath. He is very sick without anything, any other complication. I asked him to take to him to the hospital. Two hours, unfortunate, I received a phone call that he was arrested. So he was, when I take history later on up from, from his son, he said he was immobilized for three weeks due to the huge ascites. Uh, in this patient, he wasn't in DVT prophylaxis. He was in remission from his lymphoma. He had only one cycle then we will announce him in a cure. He has cancer, ascites, immobilization. He is an ambulatory patient. The question, will he will put him in DVT prophylaxis? If yes, how long? And what's the optimal dose for this patient? The second case is 61 years old male who presented with PR bleeding for one year, weight loss. He was diagnosed with sigmoid cancer. During the assessment of the third cycle, his chest CT showed lung changes suggestive of COVID-19. So he was tested and confirmed the diagnosis. He has no symptoms. He was ambulatory. He was excellent response for his chemo. Again, we will put him now with another risk of COVID-19. Dr. Shaif, I think he will answer this question for us. Would you start DVT prophylaxis? Can he has cancer, COVID, as well he has his PR bleeding, he's an ambulatory patient. Again, if we yes, for how long? 
and what's the optimal dose for such patient. So if we go important of VTE prophylaxis in cancer, thromboembolism is the second leading preventable cause of death in cancer patient with higher mortality and morbidity than VTE in population without cancer. In a review of 8 million patients admitted to the hospital, VTE those with concurrent malignancy, they had 94% probability of death within six months, where those without cancer, they had 29 probability of dying within the same time period. The VTE could be a marker rather than independent risk for early mortality for cancer patient. If we go VTE in cancer, it's totally different than other patients. The apparent VTE, when they come with VTE, it's only 10%. From autopsy series have described higher rate of thrombosis of for certain tumor types. Still, we are lacking from the hematology literature. We are lacking a lot of information. From this study, the uh, thrombosis was found 30% of patients who died from pancreatic CA. And the incidence was over 50 of the tumors, if it's in the body or the tail. And they conclude, depending on the type, location, stage, and the time since diagnosis, it will influence the risk of VTE, along with patient comorbidity. If he has obesity, if he has history of thrombophilia, history of VTE, family history, all these comorbidity related to patient Unfortunate cancer can precede the patient diagnosis of malignancy. As we all know, idiopathic DVT, there is 40% chance they could have within one year malignancy, underlying malignancy. It can present a time of diagnosis during treatment or during hospitalization or another mean any time during malignancy, during chemotherapy, they will have VTE. Inpatient risk, we consider it is a greater, but with the vast majority of VTE occur as outpatient, as all of us now toward chemotherapy as outpatient, stem cell transplant as outpatient. So majority of VTE will occur after patient being discharged. So individual with cancer may also have higher risk of bleeding, the anticoagulation. This is why when we decide, and maybe this is why we are not doing good job because always we're concerned about bleeding those patients. Don't forget those patients could be have bone marrow involvement, drugs induced thrombocytopenia, malignancy induced thrombocytopenia, impaired coagulation. So usually to balance the anticoagulation bleeding versus thrombosis is very difficult in such cases. In cancer, PTE in cancer patient totally different. We know about the tri virtual triad. It's all about hypercoagulability. They have endothelial injury. They have a stasis. But there is also related to the thrombosis, to the tumor specific. Tumor can induce hypercoagulability. Tumor can induce a thrombosis per se. And tumor specific factors, they, tumor cells can express a coagulant activity, induce a thrombin generation, versus the patient non cancerous tissue they can express a pro-coagulant activity in response to the tumor. So we have related to the tumor specific. Anatomical factors, tumor per se, sometimes we can see lymphoma, very huge, compressing the neck, vessels, abdomen, renal, but we have anatomical factors. In addition, patient-specific factors. Patient could have thrombophilia. As we all know, recently there was one study Factor 5 leaden was contributed in malignancy. And last, ther therapy related factors. And as we can know, thalidomide, aspergenase, other immunotherapy can be related to the associated factors. Surgery in those patients, if they have intra abdominal or pelvic surgery procedure, they can induce. Sometimes we use laparoscopic procedure for biopsy. All these are therapy-related factors. I will be focusing on VTE risk in ambulatory cancer patient, just to show you it's very vital and imperative for us to assist each patient. 
the risk in ambulatory setting is around 8 to 19 in cancer, depending on the cancer type. Most of the study, they came from solid tumor, unfortunate. From another study, Danish cohort study, we can see the ambulatory, the VTE risk factors in the first year after cancer diagnosis. And another from United States, they have also in six months, one year, and two years. And as the incidence, with time will be decreased. But how about hematological malignancy? Do we have enough literature to indicate how much VTE risk in ambulatory patient? So the second question, can we predict who are at risk? The, especially we are talking about patient ambulatory cancer patient. Risk assessment tool we have for cancer associated thrombosis. We have corona score which was published in 2008. And really, it was an excellent score, changed the practice of most of us. And this is score, and it was the first score to identify ambulatory patient with solid cancer or lymphoma at high risk of VTE prior to cancer therapy. Internal external validation reports was excellent for this study. And mainly, it's depend on this six, about tumor, stomach pancreas, high-risk tumor, lung gynecology, and they excluded prostate, hemoglobin level, pre-chemotherapy leukocyte, and pre chemo platelets, and the body mass index. And this is corona predictive model. Risk, low risk is among almost 0.3 to 0.8%. One to two points, it's one to two percent. If it's more than three and above, it reach almost seven. So it's really excellent corona fires, uh, corona predictive models. The limitation of this model, unfortunately, we still there is carry risk, and we know it is the second leading cause in cancer. So it's not eliminated the risk. Other questions, how about other hematology malignancy? Many hematology malignancy have been excluded for corona therapy from uh, corona models. So we didn't know. How about a patient in therapy? Because corona model, it should be on patient when he is pre-chemotherapy. It meant for venous, not arterial thrombosis. So really, there is still limitation. We cannot use corona predictive models to detect VTE in all our ambulatory patients. And I said initially, how can we use it in malignancy? This is uh, the use it in acute myeloid leukemia. And it was single experience institution. And the goal was to validate the use of the score as a risk scoring system for thrombosis among patients with AML. And the conclusions among AML patients with the score one to three, we found higher incidence of thrombic events, but the difference between this group was not statistic statistically significant. And the proportion of more or equal to three was relatively low, because largely it was an acute leukemia. The, those patients are pancytopenia, which is common representation, more majority of our patients. So this suggested we need another validation score for those such cases like AML. Then we have BEDWA score. BEDWA score is a good score. Uh, I think most of the elect electronic, uh, our computer uh, system, they are using BEDWA score. But is it fair to use it in an ambulatory cancer patient? Because it's meant mainly for hospitalized medical patient. Then, 2016, we have a trolley score, thrombosis, lymphoma score. And it's good score, easily to be used. And good about this score is to talk about, is to predict both venous and arterial thrombotic events in ambulatory lymphoma patient. Majority of our patients, we treat them as outpatient. And as we can see, the score is composed of seven clinical and laboratory variables and deliver in 1,236 patients. 
it's excellent score, but still the limitation of this score, it is need still more additional external validation before we can use it in a clinical practice. Then they start to develop a scoring specific disease specific score, like AT thrombosis score. And this is score is based on age and older, they will give it more 60 and above, they will give it one point, cardiovascular, one point, previous thrombosis, and jack positive two points. And they could do the estimated risk of arterial and venous event in a high risk group if they are more than three point. Limitation of this score, although it's appears to perform well in external validation, its ability to improve risk adapted prophylaxis need to be confirmed in further prospective study. Multiple myeloma is another disease very common. Everything a first while cancer induces, everything in multiple myeloma, drug therapy is there, and a uh, patient risk factor, disease risk factor, everything in multiple myeloma. And the international work of myeloma, they proposed this recommendation, but still it is based on expert opinion without any validation to study it. They start to, this is a good meta-analysis. They review corona reduction for venous thromboembolism and they compare it with others. And this meta-analysis show that corona score can select high-risk patients, but still the limitation of corona need to be taken into account, including the different of predicted performance across cancer type. We cannot use solid tumors as malignant tumor. And they acknowledge other VTE production tools, but they need their performance was better than Corona score, but still this score need to be prospective validated. And there is no doubt we need also to predict models for bleeding events as a mainly as this is our concern in patient with cancer. Then we have, recently we have this interesting study. It's they said, okay, it's mainly clinical. Why we don't think about something else? If we can do genetic risk model for predicting venous thromboembolic event in patient with cancer. And they call it TQ-Onco. And they compare it according to cancer, to corona patient. And the score was calculated for each patient and their VTE productive accuracy was compared. No doubt the INCO was better predictive power in this regard than the corona score. And this is open the future toward personalized thromboprophylaxis. The limitation of this score is excellent, but uh, is each hospital going to have these SNPs and they will do genetic risk assessment for each patient? I think financially, People who will, the lab need more financially, we need the expert in reading it. Uh, I'm not sure, but this is one of the future. It's very confusing, I think, for everyone. Many tools have predict, and all our aim is to protect our patient with less side effect. So whenever we go for prophylaxis recommendations, we look for, as we said, we need three things we need for any guidelines to focus in the outpatient PTE and ambulatory patient. In patient, we have to see if this is surgery or versus surgery. I look at these uh, three cancer-specific guidelines. The ASCO guideline will talk in details, but they recommended expanding the use VTE prophylaxis in outpatient to include selected scoring, corona score of two or higher with the previous the briefest version of ASCO, it was a three. So they lower the threshold for corona. Then the NCC guidelines did not recommend the routine VTE prophylaxis in outpatient, except for high risk patient with multiple myeloma. The international consistent work also, they didn't specify address outpatient. Previous guidelines from this group had recommended prophylactic for those with acute lymphoblastic leukemia receiving 
aspergenase. We'll go a little bit in detail in ASCO guidelines this year, 2019. The question was, should ambulatory patient with cancer receive anticoagulation for FTE prophylaxis during systemic chemotherapy? The recommendation in a routine pharmacological should not offer to all patients with cancer. You have high three risk minutes. outpatient, how three high minutes. risk out three minutes? Uh, this is, we can go a bit, it's not recommended except for high. Should hospitalized patient with cancer receive anticoagulation? The same thing, they didn't recommend routine, they are against except if the patient have another uh, against minor procedure or chemotherapy. So outpatient patient with cancer and they were going surgery, they recommended. And this is the NCC guidelines just to show you for multiple myeloma, they recommended. And we recently, we have the management aspergenase and the guiding group recommendation from SSH when to give DVT prophylaxis. So what the best type of anticoagulation? We have many uh, studies, DUAX or uh, low molecular weight heparin, very, heparin, very famous study. We have Cassini and Effort. All these studies have been done, drugs versus placebo. We don't have a study comparing low molecular weight heparin versus uh, DUAX. This is Epixaban. It's a published abstract in patient for multiple myeloma. Another recommendation, and they excluded hematological malignancy. And we have safe ankle low molecular weight heparin for patient. And this study was mainly for solid tumor. And for those patients, the answer, they carry low risk and there were no prophylaxis. The optimal dose, we, all of us, we give patient low molecular weight heparin, the prophylaxis dose, but recently we have published a study and adjusted dose. If we can give this patient adjusted dose rather than to give fixed dose of low molecular weight heparin, the adjusted dose seem to do much better than fixed dose of low molecular weight heparin. So advantage or limitation of this study, it's a small study. It's good because they addressed overweight patient and they took. There are many upcoming trials. I look at it's almost 41 study. Still, they are studying and this is upcoming trials. Although they are project completed, I couldn't find the reference. So the future perspective, there is no doubt we need reduction tools aiming to address the limitation of corona score we need to add to these tools for novel biomarkers or genetic information. We need it simple, easy for all cancer. We cannot take it disease by disease. We need a practice, uh, a tools which has been added to electronic file. Take a home message, despite the awareness, unfortunate of scientific society regarding cancer associated, still thrombophilaxis is limited among outpatient. And when we are using, when we decide, we need to discuss with the patient and weigh the benefit of a bleeding versus thrombosis. We need periodic assessment to the patient, need to personalize thrombophilaxis for each patient, and new evidence is needed, including validated risk assessment adapted into our clinical practice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof, for, for your nice presentation. Uh, we'll keep the questions uh, till the end of the uh, session. Uh, just before we proceed to our next uh, talk, uh, just to inform you, this webinar will be uh, recorded and will be available in the SSBD uh, YouTube. And uh, also, I'd like to thank uh, Pfizer Company for their sponsoring for this uh, activity. Our next speaker for tonight is Dr. Hazza Zahrani. He's a consultant hematologist at King Faisal Specialist Hospital in Riyadh. He will talk about treatment of cancer-associated thrombosis. Dr. Hazza. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, Dr. Osman. It's my uh, honor and pleasure to uh, be with the colleagues tonight and uh, uh, go over an overview of uh, 
treatment of cancerous thrombosis. Are the slides uh, gone? You can see them. Right? So yes, sir. Yes, yes. Clear, yeah, sound is clear. Okay, so yeah. as you all know, and as uh, already uh, stated by Dr. Farja, uh, uh, cancer patients are facing a double geopark of the cancer itself and the increased risk of thrombotic complications. And even when they develop the thrombotic complications, they face the uh, special increased risk of both recurrence and bleeding of the, uh, the thrombotic area. And this is uh, also uh, complicated by multiple issues like the comorbidity, the renal insufficiency, the high rate of nausea and vomiting, which limits uh, the intake of medications and leads to dehydration, increased risk of thrombosis and immobility. The concurrent pro-thrombotic conditions, uh, the increased risk of thromb bleeding by either uh, thrombocytopenia caused by the tumor itself or by mucosal lesion and the stress just right. Uh, another difficulty is these patients are only, uh, are usually on polypharmacy, the multiple medications that can lead to uh, interaction with uh, the anticoagulant and these uh, uh, side effects. Malnourishment and underweight also make it some but difficult to give the optimal dosing of some of these anticoagulants. And uh, another factor is patient preference will also dictate the choice of uh, the uh, anticoagulants we, we use to treat these patients. Uh, patients who uh, would require uh, various laboratory testing would ultimately would request uh, a simpler form of medication. Also, those who are receiving injections may come and complain that they cannot continue the frequent injection. Medication cost is another consideration. As you all know, the, there are three phases of anticoagulant therapy. The, the initial phase, which is the first uh, few days uh, for normal course heparin, where it would be followed by medications like warfarin or doxepa. 10 days for apixaban or 21 days for rivaroxaban. And then a long-term therapy, which is meant to be the continuation of anticoagulation beyond the initial phase up to six months of uh, therapy. And then maybe move to the extended anticoagulant therapy beyond six months, where this area is an evidence-poor area where there is no much of uh, data to uh, support our day-to-day -day practice. Now, there is uh, two landmark trials that looked at the comparison of glomerulic heparin with uh, oral anticoagulant, and that showed that glomerulic heparin uh, uh, leads to significantly lower risk of recurrence of uh, thrombosis in cancer patients. And this is the catch the clock trial and also the catch trial, two la la major studies that has become a landmark and change the practice of the way we manage cancer associated thrombosis. However, with the uh, uh, entry of uh, DOAC to practice, clinical practice, uh, four major uh, studies uh, using direct oral anticoagulants in comparison to the standard of care, the lomericoid heparin, and particularly dolceparin, which is the only drug that has a label or the only lomericoid heparin that has a label for uh, cancer associated thrombosis. And then, uh, so we had four trials, focus I trial, looking at edoxapan versus uh, dolceparin, an non inferior trial, and it was proven that this drug was non inferior to, to dolceparin, uh, but there was an increased risk of uh, major. Select B trial was a comparison of uh, rivaroxaban versus uh, dolceparin, and they showed a reduced risk of recurrent thrombosis with increased risk of major bleeding after six months of initial drug therapy. Uh, Adam T trial, uh, or Adam VTE trial, which is a trial uh, of uh, Pixaban versus uh, Dolceparin. And again, this was associated with an inferior with regards to the primary endpoint of uh, major bleeding and a robust relative risk reduction of the current thrombosis. So, uh, the largest 
studies number Y was the Caravaggio trial, which compared Apixaban to uh, Dolceparin and uh, demonstrated non inferiority of Apixaban to uh, 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 Dolceparin with regard to recurrent post recurrent venous thrombosis. And there was a comparable uh, major risk. This is the uh, clot trial. You see a higher risk of venous thrombosis around 16% versus around uh, 7% in the dolceparin. And this is the edoxapin trial showing uh, uh, almost uh, a similar uh, rate of uh, composite endpoint of occurrence and major bleeding. But it was statistically significant for non inferiority. This is uh, the uh, same study looking at the recurrence of DT as a secondary endpoint, which was slightly higher, but not reaching statistical significance for the suffering. And the risk of major bleeding was higher with the doxapan and statistically compared to the doxapan. Uh, this study looking at the uh, rivaroxaban in cancer patients called Felix D trial, as I mentioned, and it showed a uh, lower risk of uh, recurrence compared to uh, dolcaparin. And the, however, the major bleeding was higher, but not reaching statistical significance. But the clinically uh, relevant non major bleed was statistically higher in the rivaroxaban than dolcaparin. And for Apixaban, this is trial, I'm just mentioning here the Caravaggio trial, which is the largest trial. And it showed that Apixaban uh, had a, a tendency to a lower risk of uh, uh, the recurrent PTE. And the uh, major bleeding was almost uh, similar, which, uh, which basically the only drug that showed no insidious uh, major. Uh, and other drugs, although it was not specifically for the product. This is from a, a meta analysis that was published recently in blood uh, a month back. But uh, just to show you that the distribution of the gender was only slightly higher in the select D trial, the age was uh, almost the same, but tended to be higher uh, a little bit. In the uh, Caravaggio trial and the selective compared to the focal uh, side trial. Metastatic disease was well distributed, but a little bit higher in the Caravaggio trial. And the eye cancer, which is very, very important here, is that uh, this is higher in Rivaroxaban, 45%, compared to the uh, Apixaban trial, which may explain why GIP was higher in the Rivaroxaban arm. Um, in the Rivaroxaban studies compared to the other uh, studies. The occurrence of BCA was very similar in the different trials uh, 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 compared to the uh, dolceparin, but uh, apparently uh, lower for Apic, Apic Adam, Adam trial compared to the other. Uh, major bleeding was uh, numerically a little higher, but as we said, it was statistically significant. Uh, uh, only for the Dioxapan. Uh, and the uh, clinically relevant major bleed was higher in the uh, but so, And there was a tendency higher in the Dioxapan. Uh, so, if we can summarize uh, the four trials, they, uh, they are, there are many differences, including the year of publication. The Dioxapan, uh, the Dioxapan, and the Dioxapan trials were published much earlier. Uh, two years earlier. Uh, males were higher in the select D trials when these patients tend to have worse uh, prognosis with regard to the current BCE than patients with uh, than females. Uh, the index event, pulmonary embolism plus or minus uh, DDT, was higher in the select D uh, trial, which also tends to have worse prognosis compared to DDT alone. Uh, incidental PE was uh, not reported in the Adam trial and was higher in this HD, but we know that incidental pulmonary embolism carries the same clinical significance as the symptomatic uh, Prior venous thrombosis was not reported in the selective trial, 
and uh, it was higher in the longer tooth uh, uh, for uh, metastatic diseases were higher in the affected band, and GI malignancies were higher in the affected band. The Adam P trial, Adam PDPE trial, had more subclavian and hepatic vein thrombosis. The Caravaggio study included symptomatic DVT of the upper limb as a current. Overall, very large number of patients have been studied in a prospective randomized manner, close to 3,000 patients. They, they reflect the day to day clinical practice because the majority of these patients have, uh, were actively treated with uh, chemotherapy, and the majority have uh, metastatic disease. And there was a uh, central adjudication uh, of the studies, which were uh, blinded for the allocated therapy. The negative point is there was no open label design because sub Q placebo is inappropriate. Uh, and uh, there is no head to head comparison between the different DOAs. And there was some lack of uh, details in some subgroups. Uh, uh, DOAC uh, uh, tended to have higher uh, major bleeding and uh, clinically relevant major bleeding, but uh, uh, the uh, studies have shown that they should be avoided in patients with high risk bleeding, like those with uh, GI or DO malignant. The conflicting results between the studies may relate to the different pharmaco pharmacodynamics of the different drugs and the enrollment of the tumor GI cancer patients at high risk of bleeding in the Caravaggio trial and Adam, Adam DP trial uh, may be uh, a reason for a lower risk of uh, GI bleeding and uh, for uh, overall risk of bleeding. But observational studies have suggested that uh, apixaban may be associated with lower risk of uh, gastrointestinal bleeding in general, even in the previous study. Now, this is a very important and hot topic for all clinicians, and uh, I'm showing you a very busy slide here. Uh, almost every two months, uh, meta-analysis is published looking at the different two acts compare, uh, and comparing them with the long wave separate. This is one of the latest uh, uh, one, the blood publication, and they have looked at different studies, and it included the ADAM trial from the analysis of some missing data and some uh, from of specificity in the study. And I'm sorry, showing you here the uh, outcome of this meta-analysis, showing that the recurrent BTB tends to be lower for all the DOACs compared to the low molecular heparin. And uh, major bleeding was higher for the uh, apixaban and eduxaban, but was similar to the uh, low molecular heparin in the uh, Caravaggio trial apixaban study. Composite of major bleeding and recurrent thrombosis was uh, uh, tended to be better for edoxaban and so, sorry for apixaban and rivaroxaban, but was similar to the lamotrigine in the edoxaban. The clinically relevant uh, major bleed is higher for all the drugs, highest for rivaroxaban. Uh, the all cause mortality. Uh, it tended to be lower for the apixaban and river. The GI bleeding was higher in the medoxaban, uh, uh, apixaban, and uh, rivaroxaban and apixaban. So to summarize, the, there's a relative risk reduction of venous thromboembolism recurrence with two acts compared to. Uh, uh, low molecular heparin, self-separin particular. Major bleeding was uh, similar and uh, with a, a tendency to have lower risk of uh, major bleeding for DOAC. The clinically relevant major, uh, non-major bleed tended to be lower for uh, self-separin. The current guidelines endorse the DOAC as a very uh, valid option for initial and uh, long-term treatment of patients with cancer. The ICH here shows you apixaban, uh, uh, edoxaban, and rivaroxaban are uh, preferred agents. 
uh, and also all of the difference. We asked to suggest that initial and drug rituximab and edoxaban uh, are preferred to over the vaccine key antagonist, but this was published before the Karapagi trial. Uh, the international uh, initiative of thrombosis and cancer also suggests that the rivaroxaban and edoxaban uh, can be used as alternative to loma heparin. The NCCN guidelines suggested all the new oral anticoagulants to be used for initial anticoagulation. And the European school, so they were older, I also suggested that edoxaban and rivaroxaban should be considered as an alternative to uh, loma so in conclusion, the current landscape for treatment of cancer associated thrombosis seems to support DUAC over the current standard of care with the adoxaparin. Choosing the optimum anticoagulant drug uh, for cancer associated thrombosis should be based on a careful balance of the risk of, uh, risk of recurrent VTE and bleeding and the potential drug-drug interaction and the patient preference. Uh, besides loma heparin, current guidelines suggest that the use of uh, Reduxaban, Rivaroxaban, uh, and also the NCC and Rivaroxaban as a uh, valid option for treatment of uh, uh, cancer thrombosis, with the exception of GI cancer or those who are at high risk of bleeding. Uh, DOACs are uh, effective treatment options and safe for most cancer patients with BT. And newer guidelines will include Epixaban and uh, just that this may be. With that, I end my presentation. Thank you very much. For that. Thank you very much, Dr. Hazza, for your nice presentation. Uh, our uh, next speaker for tonight is Dr. Mohammed Sharif. He is a consultant uh, internist with the interest in venous thromboembolism at King Fahad. Mid uh, Medical City in Riyadh. He will talk about special issues, COVID-19 infection and thrombosis. Dr. Mohammed, you can unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. Okay. Thank okay. you for the introduction. If you allow me to share screen. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's really my pleasure and honor to present about this uh, topic, uh, thrombosis and coagulopathy in uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, patient. Uh, really, I would like to start uh, my presentation by uh, thanking the Saudi Society for Blood Disorder for this uh, informative uh, symposium about cancer as thrombosis. Although the theme is about cancer as thrombosis, but we are just uh, discussing very hot uh, topic about COVID-19 infection and uh, thrombosis. It is emerging uh, hypercoagulable disease. I uh, would like to start first, just show this slide uh, about the COVID-19 data tsunami. Really, we have a tsunami of uh, data of COVID-19 and physicians are drowning in COVID-19 paper, about 23,000 papers and doubling every 20 days. It's very difficult to catch up about all, you know, uh, updates of uh, COVID-19. And uh, start by highlighting my uh, learning objectives. Uh, after uh, attending this webinar, uh, participant will be able to review the cross-link between thrombosis and inflammation discuss the common coagulopathic abnormalities in COVID-19 and provide some uh, practical guidance for prevention of thrombosis and management of coagulopathy uh, in COVID-19, mainly uh, ICH and uh, CHEST uh, guideline and recently published uh, American Society uh, of Hematology. Uh, also to integrate the latest evidence about thrombosis and COVID-19 into clinical practice, which is the most important 
and to uh, briefly how uh, manage effectively and virtually anticoagulation and thrombosis in uh, COVID-19 era and want to request diagnostic imaging for COVID-19 with uh, suspected uh, VTE. I will start, uh, you know, to put you in uh, perspective by two uh, dramatic uh, case presentation whom I managed uh, in the inpatient uh, covering COVID-19 uh, team. Uh, a 45-year-old female with no chronic illness, previously healthy. Uh, she was brought to the hospital after a transient loss of consciousness at home, followed a two-week uh, history of dry cough and shortness of breath and three-day history of palpitation. She was found to have uh, right-sided weakness, uh, typical, you know, stroke uh, symptoms. She was desighting and hypotensive. Her uh, NIH score was 21, indicating very severe stroke. So she was uh, diagnosed with a massive uh, PE, uh, acute uh, stroke, large vessel stroke, splenic and renal infarctions. Uh, her SARS uh, coronavirus 2 PCR screen came back positive about three days after hospitalization. So, so this patient, her initial uh, laboratory parameter, she has leukocytosis uh, and she has uh, lymphos neutrophil to lymph to lymphocyte uh, ratio is uh, decreased, uh, platelet count is normal, uh, troponin was high, uh, problem B was high, lactate was high, D-dimer was very high, uh, LDH was high, and ferritin, this is the initial uh, you know, uh, result, but later on, the second day, it was uh, tripled and increased. So all inflammatory markers were uh, elevated in this uh, patient. So this is the CTPA, uh, showed uh, bilateral massive uh, PE, sudden pulmonary embolism. Uh, this patient have very uh, resistant, uh, high potential. Uh, we could not uh, thrombolyze this patient with our systemic or uh, catheter direct thrombolysis due to the presence of uh, bilateral uh, large uh, vessel stroke with uh, hemorrhagic transformation. So this patient very, you know, a dramatic uh, presentation. Remember that COVID-19 is a great mimicker of multiple diseases. Uh, and uh, from this, we think that uh, any uh, patient presenting with a vascular uh, presentation, whether BTE or stroke, think uh, COVID-19 status should be uh, checked. Uh, this is another patient. Uh, this is about uh, two weeks ago. Uh, young, uh, he's middle-aged patient without any uh, chronic illness. Uh, also presented with uh, unprovoked massive DVT with a limb venous gang threatening gangrene. So phlegmasia, serola dolens, uh, and uh, ER physician consulted uh, vascular surgery as acute ischemic limb. Then they requested Doppler, and they found it is extensive aleofemoral thrombosis up to the external iliac, uh, and uh, CT was done, uh, CT angio, and showed uh, a picture that uh, you know, similar or compatible with Mayfair syndrome, i.e. right iliac artery crossing the left. Iliac vein, uh, COVID screen uh, came back uh, positive. Uh, this patient, actually, he have, he's presented in a very advanced uh, stage. Uh, I think this is, uh, you know, uh, related to patient reluctance to seek medical advice and fear from exposure of COVID-19 from the emergency. That's why they present late with catastrophic presentation, like I see in the first patient and the second patient. So this patient underwent, underwent IBC filter insertion and uh, catheter-directed thrombolysis. It was pharmacomechanical through angiogenic uh, technique, and and because they uh, diagnosed him to have uh, Mayferner uh, syndrome. So this patient about. Uh, he's 58. Uh, why he developed DVT right now? I think this is multifactorial. The COVID-19 coagulopathy, in addition to the mechanical factor, Mayferner uh, syndrome. So this is another case. So this is uh, post catheter directed, uh, you know, thrombolysis or pharmacomechanical, a significant improvement. So uh, the limb back to the uh, normal color, also the size uh, regressed significantly, and there is hematuria because the hemoglobinuria due to the uh, fragmentation of the thrombus.
another uh, patient this is just uh, i it's very you know disease it has i would say heterogeneous presentation so like young patient they die from uh, massive pe and the other hand we have seen elderly patients super sincere in uh, saudi uh, female who recovered from covid 19 so so the picture is uh, heterogeneous we don't know exactly we cannot pinpoint we say this patient is gonna you know die or this patient will be complicated course nobody knows it depends on the immune uh, system uh, host immune uh, response and i will show you uh, in the subsequent slides about the link between thrombosis and uh, inflammation so this is our uh, you know uh, status uh, in uh, saudi arabia so we have this is the uh, the most recent update today we have 258,000 uh, and uh, recovery, mashallah, 210,000. Uh, and the recovery rate re uh, reached to 80%, and mortality rate about 1%, uh, which is 10 times less than international you know, figures. And globally, we reached to 15 uh, million. So the, interestingly, the etiology of this virus, all we know it is uh, uh, severe acute respiratory uh, syndrome coronavirus 2. Uh, it is RNA virus that belongs to the uh, beta uh, coronavirus. Very interesting, it is homologous, the SARS coronavirus uh, that, you know, caused uh, the epidemic uh, 2004. It also the uh, SARS coronavirus, uh, one associated with large vessel stroke and uh, increased risk of uh, vascular uh, thrombosis. So that's why they are really, uh, uh, I mean, identical uh, to each other. Uh, so where do we stand with COVID-19? Uh, you know, the pathogenesis that I shed light more on it, it is, uh, so we know the virus uses ACE2 as a receptor. ACE2 a receptor very rich in the respiratory tract. They bind to spike to glycoprotein on a viral envelope. In response to viral antigen, we have immune cells uh, release pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines result in uncontrolled systemic inflammatory response. Uh, a picture that, uh, that mimic cytokine storm syndrome or HLH, LHH, uh, or, uh, or the other name for it, uh, macrophage activation syndrome and hemophagic uh, uh, syndrome. So the incubation is uh, and contagious period variable. I will not just you know, uh, discuss it, just the clinical presentation. Yes, the mo yet the most common uh, clinical presentation is respiratory, uh, fever, dry cough, malaise, myalgia, headache and dyspnea, but they, this disease can present with polyvascular disease. It can present with a PTE, DVTP, it can present with stroke, with acute MI, it can present with microvascular thrombosis. So it can have also very interesting about this virus is like the presentation, you know, a weird presentation, loss of uh, smell, uh, loss of taste. So this is really, you know, uh, treatment for this uh, virus. Uh, we don't have specific or target treatment. We have what we call open buffet approach. So this is the, the only, uh, you know, uh, I would say viral infection that we use. Imagine we are using all these supportive therapy, oxygen, vitamin D, vitamin C, zinc, antibiotics, uh, steroidic, methazone, and uh, methabrednisone, hydroxychloroquine, uh, antiviral, uh, favipravir, and uh, remdesivir, interferon beta, uh, tocilizumab, as interleukin-6 uh, bathroom inhibitor, conversant plasma, which is very promising, and anticoagulation. So we are using, uh, I mean, uh, shotgun approach, uh, you know, to fight, uh, to combat this uh, disease. So I will focus about the anticoagulation, which is, uh, you know, the theme of my presentation. So just to know that uh, COVID-19 uh, is hypercoagulable state. Uh, the natural history is different than the usual uh, venous thromboembolism, you know. So the usual uh, VT, we know that DVT form in the uh, leg distal, uh, I mean distal uh, DVT below the knee, and uh, usually distal have 25% uh, embolization to the lung, and if it is a proximal, uh, the risk of embolization about 50% in spite of absence of chest symptoms, and it can have multiple showering of emboli, or they can have massive pulmonary embolism. We think this is in uh, COVID-19, this is different. It is pulmonary, thrombosis, pulmonary artery thrombosis rather than pulmonary embolism. So it is uh, de novo uh, 
pulmonary uh, embolism or uh, in situ pulmonary artery thrombosis uh, because this is observation was found in other studies and they uh, we call it like immuno pulmonary uh, thrombosis yes they have uh, dvt but most common they have pulmonary embolism and they can have presentation with micro uh, vascular thrombosis in the skin like this is a perbore crash this is uh, this is uh, levator reticularis. This is a stroke. So they can present uh, acute MI. So different presentation uh, and really have, uh, I mean, wide spectrum of vascular presentation. And this is very nice, you know, uh, scheme uh, to show you that uh, it can cause arterial thrombosis. So stroke, also acute MI. Our colleague in cardiology, they noticed many patients they have acute. I'm covering currently COVID-19. Many patients like transfer from I'm sorry, I'm covering non-COVID uh, team. So many patients uh, transferred from COVID team to non-COVID uh, after, you know, uh, recovery, but still they have acute coronary syndrome. So acute coronary syndrome is very one of the manifestation of uh, COVID-19. Also, they can have uh, PE, uh, DVT can have microvascular thrombosis uh, and endothelial damage. So they have different, you know, wide spectrum of vascular presentation. So I call it uh, polyvascular uh, disease. So the pulmonary thrombosis and COVID-19, uh, so they have what we think it is not like systemic DIC, they call it local uh, DIC in the lung, pulmonary uh, DIC, pulmonary vascular thrombosis with subsequent activation of, you know, fibrinolysis, uh, vascular microthrombosis. So the concept of uh, pulmonary thrombosis has been recently proposed for condition other than, uh, you know, uh, COVID-19, like a pneumonia, uh, asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. We think this patient, they present with PE more than, you know, uh, DVT. That's why we call it, you know, pulmonary thrombosis. So the de development of DIC, uh, local DIC, is due to activation of cytokine producing monocytes, such as interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor, which in turn induce activation of endothelial cells and tissue factor that triggers the blood coagulation uh, cascade. So they would have what we call endotheliitis, you know, and leakage of the uh, capillaries uh, that lead to uh, ARDS. Uh, so this activation of blood coagulation, this is essential in counteracting viral infection along with immune uh, system. So uh, this is uh, beneficial, you know, to, uh, you know, fibrin, uh, you know, production to trap uh, viruses uh, by uh, fibrin uh, network, uh, thus limiting uh, their uh, dissemination. However, what will happen, this is like over, uh, you know, reaction or massive inflammatory and coagulative uh, response uh, is dangerous because it can lead to uh, thrombosis in the lungs, like the, what we call immune dysregulation in this uh, case. So, uh, so this is, there is pulmonary uh, immunothrombosis and COVID-19 infection. So what will happen, you know, uh, this is post-mortem finding showing microthrombosis or uh, this is uh, fibrin necrosis. So you have the cytokine storm that lead to endothelial activation, also platelet activation, uh, leading to tissue factor activation, uh, pathway leading to the fibrin formation and uh, thrombosis and down regulation of thrombomodulin because this is natural anticoagulant. Um, in addition, this is uh, about pulmonary postmortem finding, a series of COVID-19 cases from Northern Italy uh, and showed this is uh, microvascular uh, thrombosis. This is from the lung. And uh, what the cross link between hemostasis and inflammation? Uh, we know that uh, this is uh, inflammation uh, leading to activation of the coagulation cascade, uh, leading to uh, conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin. And we have fibrin uh, clot uh, lysis leading to the uh, what we call D-dimer production. So we have activation of coagulation and uh, fibrino uh, lysis uh, pathway. So, uh, so there is a cross link between thrombosis and inflammation. This is what will happen if you have, uh, you know, like many other infection, but we think COVID-19 is more intense, you know, different than other. And I will show you uh, the risk uh, between uh, uh, hospital acquired thrombosis from pneumonia versus COVID-19. This is different than other viruses. There is a significant cross link between inflammation and coagulation. We know about it. COVID-19 stimulate the uh, endothelium, activation of the endothelium, activation of the monocular cells and neutrophil monocytes that lead to the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines and uh, chemokines that activate the tissue factor uh, mediated 
coagulation activation and leading to fibrin uh, formation. And this, you know, uh, the fibrin uh, formation uh, also activate inflammatory cells that produce inflamatory cytokine. There is a vicious uh, cycle leading to the activation of coagulation and inhibition of fibrinolysis and there is an impairment of natural anticoagulants. So severe COVID-19 generate an increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines and activation in the ferial cells, they can, uh, you know, in the ferritis, neutrophils, uh, monocytes, and uh, platelet leading to tissue uh, factor mediated activation of coagulation, uh, and also the inflammatory response to COVID-19 result in activation of coagulation that itself may modulate further inflammatory activity. Uh, this is just to show you the uh, similar to the previous, you know, uh, diagram uh, or cartoon. So, uh, in response to uh, uh, COVID-19 infection, you have uh, endothelial uh, activation, uh, also activation of the uh, monocytes that uh, they secrete uh, the pro-inflammatory cytokines uh, from uh, the endothelium and uh, three minutes. Uh, lead, three minutes. Or, uh, lead Okay, leading to the formation of clot. So D-dimer is a fiber and degradation product. Uh, why are D-dimer levels increase in COVID-19? Uh, we think uh, this is as a result of the uh, systemic from being generation and subsequent fibrin uh, formation. So we know that uh, uh, D-dimer is a marker of coagulation and fibrinolysis activation, but in COVID-19 used as a biomarker for disease severity and mortality uh, in these uh, patient. So uh, we know D-dimer is elevated in many condition, and uh, now we COVID-19 infection, so we cannot rely on D-dimer uh, for to roll in or roll out uh, VTE because this is non-specific marker. It has only excellent uh, negative uh, productive value. So we know the incidence of VTE in COVID-19 uh, patient, it's high incidence, and we know it is more in ICU uh, or critical elevation than ward. Uh, and uh, there are many, you know, uh, reports, uh, case studies, case series, showing that ha high incidence of venous thromboembolism. Uh, and we know that undiagnosed pulmonary embolism could contribute to sudden and explain uh, respiratory uh, deterioration and uh, sudden death. So uh, very, uh, very high D-dimer point to, I think it is high risk uh, for venous thromboembolism the patient and also a marker of sever severity of uh, inflammatory uh, pulmonary disease. So uh, this is, uh, to show you this one, this is a uh, high incidence of COVID-19, uh, high, high incidence of VTE uh, in uh, COVID-19 patient compared to influenza. So this is about 485 patient COVID-19. They found a three day, 30 day incidence of uh, VTE about 3.8. This is the general word. And an ICU patient is 15%. Uh, if you combine together, going to be 18.7. Some other report, the incidence about 30% in critical elevation. But however, influenza patient 1.04. So this is really a uh, disease, uh, I mean, incidence of thrombotic complication hospitalized COVID-19 patient is very substantial and considerably high than in hospitalized influenza patient. Uh, also, you know, uh, D-dimer, just be aware it is elevated in not only in COVID-19, also in non-COVID-19 uh, patient pneumonia. So you can see this is 1.94. Almost they are, uh, you know, uh, uh, comparable to each other. Another important incidence of thrombotic complication, critical elevation, it's high, about 28, uh, about 31%, including arterial and uh, venous thromboembolism. And it's by its own uh, standard uh, or routine VT prophylaxis adjusted to uh, weight. So this indicates that we should use higher dose uh, or intensify from uh, prophylaxis to intermediate or uh, therapeutic anticoagulation. We know patients who are, uh, uh, I mean, uh, non-survival non of, uh, you know, uh, COVID-19, they have the D-dimer is very high, about 81% compared to survival about 24%. We know uh, D-dimer more than one help a clinician to identify patients with poor prognosis. Uh, this is uh, more similar. The most important, this is that this is a dynamic disease. So we know there is markedly increasing D-dimer level over time. So not only we rely on it upon uh, admission, see this, this is T, this is the initial presentation, and see this is patient, you know, non-survival, it is uh, rising uh, with time. So three to four fold over time, indicator of uh, poor, uh, you know, uh, I mean, uh, poor outcome and increased mortality. Uh, just to uh, low molecular heparin was associated with decreased uh, mortality, especially in patients with D-dimer 
more than six upper limits of normal, i.e. more than three, and patients who have uh, sepsis-induced coagulopathy. Uh, many patients, they are found to have lobus anticoagulant is uh, positive, although we know that lobus anticoagulant is transiently elevated in patients with infection. Uh, this is a case, uh, I mean, three patients presented, uh, so, you know, published in New England, uh, they have stroke and uh, antiphospholipid antibodies, but none of them have, uh, they did not report lobus anticoagulant, only anticarbulin and antipetoglycan protein. This is very important. Post-discharge, these one patients... Minute, huh? One minute, please. I, I will just go to the, uh, I mean, uh, conclusion of my presentation. This is the most reliable uh, uh, guideline, ISTH guideline, they recommend to uh, start to give routine standard VTA prophylaxis for, uh, you know, uh, ward and ICU patient uh, until the, uh, you know, available evidence from randomized control trial for uh, using therapeutic anticoagulation and uh, diagnosis. We should not rely on D-dimer to request for uh, diagnostic testing. It has to be uh, clinical, uh, you know, uh, in addition to yeah, you know, respiratory status of the patient deteriorating in spite of, uh, you know, uh, yeah, borderline or uh, just abnormal X-ray. So you need to uh, proceed uh, to just a guidelines, standard prophylaxis, uh, just to go to, this is the most recently uh, European Society of Cardiology. They recommend uh, intensification of uh, thermal prophylaxis to therapeutic uh, dose if the patient admitted to ICU. So summary and key learning point, so uh, the lab characteristics of severe COVID-19 infection are they have a mildly to a moderately reduced platelet count, usually normal count, in the most severe uh, patient. And if you have it low, like in patient last week, you have to suspect like hit, like the, our patient came to be hit. They have mild prolongation of the prothrombin time in uh, minority of patient. They have high fibrinogen level in virtually all patient with very low levels. Uh, if the patient like uh, briefly before death, they develop DIC and very elevated D-dimer level, in particular non-survival, and they have normal uh, natural anticoagulant. So the most common uh, pattern coagulopathy observed in patient hospitalized with COVID-19 is elevation in fibrinogen D-dimer, and this correlate will uh, parallel rise in marker inflammation like CRP, ferritin, and DH, unlike the better seen in classic DIC. So usually they have mild thrombophilic cytopenia. Some patients with severe COVID infection can develop a coagulopathy meeting DIC, uh, and they have, uh, I mean, full blown DIC, ICH, the DIC criteria. So, this is the last slide elevated D dimer at admission and markedly increasing uh, D dimer uh, level three to four fold over time were associated with high mortality. Uh, this is likely reflecting coagulation activation from infection, sepsis, cytokine storm, and impending organ failure. Therapeutic anticoagulation is required for VT treatment and high risk ICU patient and the efficacy of intermediate or full therapeutic anticoagulation for critically ill COVID-19 patient without documented VT is under study. So this is rapid coagul uh, coag study in Saudi Arabia. We are participating in this study. And in patients already on anticoagulation for VTE, uh, usually uh, like on DUAC, during hospitalization, you should switch to low heparin because the significant interaction with antiviral therapy and uh, prophylactic dose long heparin is recommended for all hospitalized patients. So this is now all hospitalized patients with COVID, they should receive standard routine uh, VT uh, prophylaxis. Uh, if there is contraindication, you should use uh, mechanical uh, prophylaxis to just to conclude, uh, you know, uh, by a few words of gratitude for all healthcare workers, uh, our, you know, uh, resident, okay, ER, ICU, really close contact with these uh, patient and uh, frontline treating COVID-19 patient you are really, uh, indeed, uh, super uh, heroes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed, for this nice presentation. Uh, just I would like all the speaker to unmute yourself so we can have uh, some questions. And please just be concise in answering because you have a lot of questions and very limited time. The first question, uh, do you transfuse uh, platelets for advanced bone marrow meds persistent thrombocytopenia for cancer-associated thrombosis till how long will be inpatient if he's stable? 
Dr. Hazza, Dr. Farja. Can you unmute yourself, please? Well, it depends if he meant for a treatment or prophylaxis. Uh, what he mean by stem cell meds, metastasis? Bone marrow metastasis. Bone marrow metastasis. And the patient is not clear. Well, and I will talk from my perspective uh, related to my lecture. Uh, at the bend, this patient needs to be evaluated for his DVT prophylax uh, risk if he is high or low. The second, if he, uh, there is thrombocytopenia associated and the risk of bleeding is higher, it's way out the benefit of anticoagulation, then we will not, we will use mechanical. And uh, well, our practice, if the risk of thrombosis is high, we transfuse the patient platelet to keep the platelets above 50 and we can give him DPT prophylaxis. Again, it's case by case. Dr. Hazza, any comments? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Hazza. I think I will add for those who have thrombocytopenia and, and active uh, or uh, let's say acute thrombosis or thrombosis in a few months from the, uh, on, within three months or uh, so, I think the recommendation is to uh, give full dose of uh, anticoagulants if the place is down to the above 50. And between 30 to 50, some references go down to 25, you can modify to give prophylactic dose or adjust dose for one intermediate dose, low molecular heparin. And in this situation, I would prefer low molecular heparin rather than DUA uh, when the patient counts is below 50. Uh, below uh, 30 or 25 to 30, one option is what Dr. Farja mentioned of uh, transfusing platelets and giving anticoagulation. Uh, but I think it is safer to hold anticoagulation because you cannot guarantee that when you transfuse platelets that it will remain above the test. Some of these patients have refractory problems. Sorry, I just don't know. Okay. Uh, the next question, uh, do you give low-dose anticoagulant for patients who have hematuria or blood drain from nephrostomy? Short answer, yes, if, uh, uh, and maybe none, no anticoagulation, depending on the severity and if they are an acuity of thrombosis. But if the uh, patient has serious thrombotic events, he may use low dose IV and fractions of heparin when there is active bleeding, so it has a much shorter half life and easier to reverse than other fractions. So other the uh, next question, uh, maybe for Professor Farja, would you consider prophylaxis in ambulatory cancer patients? Well, uh, this is the topic of, uh, it will be depend in case by case, uh, is it solid or hematological? Again, to assist with uh, the predictive models we have corona, we assist. If the patient is high risk, then yes, he will be considered. And there is no contraindication to start his anticoagulation as a prophylaxis dose. Again, the answer is yes. Okay, thank you. The next question, uh, would you consider DOAC in patients with GI or genitourinary cancer patients who, have, who underwent intersection of the tumor? Oh, we don't know. The answer we don't know, but it maybe makes sense that uh, when you remove the lesion that may bleed, uh, they may not be at higher risk of bleeding than the other patients that you saw in the study. Uh, if I can add, uh, the question is not clear if it's treatment or uh, prophylaxis. But if we go to the NCC guidelines, uh, they recommended uh, prefer not to start those patients in DUAX. As Dr. Hazal mentioned, it's preferably we start low molecular weight heparin easily to be managed than these long-acting drugs. Okay. The uh, next question for cancer patients with VTE during chemotherapy treatment. How long do we need to treat patients with cured cancer? Yeah, uh, uh, six months, uh, after six months, uh, if they still are receiving chemo or have active cancer, uh, you may 
continue the same dose or a reduced dose of uh, the anticoagulant, half dose, for example, 2.5 milligram of pixaban uh, uh, or 10 milligram of rivaroxaban or lower dose. Okay. The uh, next question may be similar to it. For how long can you continue lomoclaroid heparin at treatment for patients with adult carcinoma of the colon who is on chemotherapy and is doing well? But I think we answered this. But, uh, is any uh, VTEs or not? Maybe I any? think we, an yeah, we answered this. It, uh, it looks like he means with uh, thrombosis, but uh, you know, uh, patients ultimately, their adherence to injectable anticoagulants is much lower than to oral anticoagulants. Uh, so uh, I think um, uh, if the choice was to go for glomerular heparin for any reason, um, we have patients who were on glomerular heparin for five years, so before the DUAC. But nowadays, we are using DUAC mostly like the, uh, probably we'll go to the next question. Would you consider DOAC in patients with primary CNS tumor? Rifaroxaban. With primary CNS or with uh, CNS uh, metastasis from other side, would you consider uh, the yeah, the only drug that is good in the study uh, Remet per selective. No, we'll make it like that. A primary brain tumor, would you consider the work for them? As a prophylaxis or as a treatment? As a, as a treatment, I think the data is for those with brain met. Is available for uh, rivaroxaban, and it was, but it didn't increase the risk. I'm not sure about primary brain. But it was new. Well, okay. the, the, the question was like that, but, and and, uh, and I'm not sure how often to see VTEs in primary CNS tumors. Hmm. The next question, is there any score applicable to assess the bleeding risk in malignant patients with malignancy and VTE? Um, I will answer. Uh, unfortunate, uh, the score we have. Um, bleeding. And this, we have the score. Assessment risk score. Yeah, and unfortunate, mm -hmm. we have only the his blood uh, score, and we have a problem. I think some in the international, they are working in this score because it's the same score, like Shad score, they combined with a lot cross. Um, but a score where you assess the bleeding versus uh, VTE, this is what the end of the future perspective, we could have a score which could help us in both ways. Okay, the next question, uh, COVID-19 mild case on presentation but raised D-dimer level, should he receive uh, therapy, therapeutic anticoagulant? Dr. Mohammed? Uh, uh, regarding uh, hospitalized COVID-19 uh, patient, uh, should universally uh, receive uh, standard dose PT prophylaxis. So this is all hospitalized COVID-19 uh, patient. Uh, based on uh, the, the MOH guideline, also now our hospital uh, King Fahd Medical City guideline, we have uh, stratification. If the D-dimer uh, more than three, i.e. 60 or limited formal, so we uh, uh, shift them to from standard prophylaxis dose to a BID dosing, intermediate uh, dose, like uh, 40 uh, BID, for example, in Luxembourg. If they hospitalize to ICU patient, ICU patient, we are adding some criteria. If the patient ICU having ARDS, having uh, difficulty to win, you know, uh, high requirement of oxygen, uh, we uh, switch them to uh, IV. So there is no one size that fits all. So it has uh, different uh, dosage for different patients. Very interesting uh, patient, ambulatory, home isolation, who are on quarantine, 
We don't have any evidence to suggest to give them uh, VTA prophylaxis. However, if you have a patient, you know, I received this question uh, on the quarantine uh, with high risk score for VTA, like uh, obese, uh, elderly, multiple comorbidity, limited mobility, you can give uh, VTA prophylaxis, you can use oral uh, duoc like uh, abixaban or rivaroxaban for 14 days. Okay, the next question is the low platelets at presentation of COVID patient is a marker for thrombotic complication? Yes. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, this is like for COVID-19 coagulopathy, uh, they uh, rarely uh, develop a thrombocytopenia. Usually the striking feature is uh, high D-dimer and fibrinogen. Uh, and they have very uh, slight uh, elevation in uh, PT and mild thrombocytopenia. And if they have severe thrombocytopenia, so you have to look for other uh, causes like drug-induced hit, acuberinduced thrombocytopenia, or if the patient have overwhelming, you know, uh, sepsis, uh, full-blown DIC, they uh, briefly, you know, before death, they develop DIC. But very important, thrombocytopenia is not common, you know, uh, presentation. If you have it, think about alternative uh, diagnosis. Okay. There are maybe two or three questions regarding the duration of anticoagulation in COVID patients. It will continue while, uh, while they are inpatient or it will continue after discharge? Good. So if you have uh, COVID-19 uh, associated, you know, uh, thrombosis like VTE, DVT or B, so duration of anticoagulation is for three months as a provoked uh, venous thromboembolism. If uh, for uh, prophylaxis, for primary prophylaxis, Usually, uh, the ICH guideline, they recommend to extend VT prophylaxis for 14 days post-discharge. And you can use, uh, they are suggesting to use, uh, I mean, risk assist model like Umbrov or like Cabrini, what you use in Saudi Arabia. So you put it, if the patient, the risk score is high, uh, you continue after uh, discharge for 14 days. Remember, patient after discharge, they will be confined to home. They will be uh, home isolated. They have, so I think it's very uh, valid to extend. I have one patient after discharge developed massive PE that require uh, interventional uh, radiology, keftadec thrombolysis. This patient, it's really important to think about extending VTA prophylaxis uh, for these uh, patients. Okay, the next question for Dr. Hazza is uh, asking about the safety of using abixaban in patients with GI or genitourinary malignancy. In general, the guidelines we should uh, avoid these drugs with uh, mucosal tumors, uh, whether Pixaban or others, and the details of uh, major bleeding. In. And these patients are not uh, understanding very clearly. Because, man, if you allow me uh, just to answer the question of the colleague on uh, uh, the first issue of uh, uh, two and brain tumors. I quickly looked here and they, there are two retrospective studies. One had 172 patients and the incidence of intracranial hemorrhage was lower following two acts compared to low molecular uh, heparin treated patients. And this is another uh, also study in published blood November last year. And they say that our conclusion, this is 130 patients. Dr. Hazar? Okay. The works are not associated with increased risk of bleeding. Okay. The, uh, uh, next if next I can question. add one thing, but yes. always uh, those patients, they have chemotherapy and you need to look for interactions. Most of the time we cannot use it because of drug interactions. So just be careful, assist the patient case by case. Sure. Okay. The next question for Professor Farja, any uh, data support use of prophylaxis antithrombin infusion during aspergenase therapy? Uh, we have the study uh, I mentioned uh, Mark Carrier and his colleagues uh, last July 2019, and uh, they emphasize regarding the use DPT prophylaxis and FFP and thrombin generations uh, they can be giving for those patients. 
I will advise this very beautiful written review, not review, the recommendation, especially for aspergenase and uh, for management uh, fibrinogen and the thrombin. Okay. What is the most widely used score for VTE risk assessment in cancer patients? I think this has been mentioned clearly in the, in the presentation. Can post-discharge anticoagulant COVID-19 prevent acute coronary syndrome? I mean, uh, I think the answer, uh, we know that uh, VTE prophylaxis to prevent uh, venous thromboembolism. Uh, I cannot, and I don't think it's that uh, VT prophylaxis does prevent, uh, I mean, acute coronary syndrome. Although, you know, the principle of uh, dual pathway inhibition, uh, low dose uh, DOAC plus, uh, you know, low dose DOAC uh, plus aspirin, it can prevent uh, arterial, uh, peripheral arterial disease. And we know the famous study, COMBAS study. So they use, uh, I mean, like reverxiban 2.5 milligram BID to prevent it, amputation uh, in patients with peripheral arterial disease. So it's, yes, it could be, I'm extrapolating this evidence from COMBAS study. Uh, yes, it can, uh, I think, prevent mainly venous thrombomalism, but also can prevent arterial uh, uh, disease. Okay, there is another uh... Question, uh, safety of using intermittent pneumatic compression device as a DVT prophylaxis in patients with thrombocytopenia? Okay, um, I think maybe he means the efficacy of using well, pneumatic probably, yes, safety. I think, so. uh, I think there is no harm for such, uh, especially uh, you need to be careful in patients with diabetic, peripheral vascular disease, those patients you need to be careful with them. But the efficacy of it, uh, giving mechanical is better not to give nothing. There is no doubt of it. Once and if there is contraindication for anticoagulations, still we can give patient mechanical ventilations and have been compared versus placebo when there is nothing you can give. It's much better reduce the incidence of VTE. Okay. Uh, maybe last two questions. Do you recommend the D-dimer as a follow-up for COVID patients for monitoring? Yes, it is uh, recommended for hospitalized uh, COVID-19 patient uh, daily uh, D-dimer level uh, to assess severity of the disease and uh, progress. Uh, and we know rising D-dimer, uh, like doubling, you know, over time, three to four times from the baseline, this is a marker for uh, prognosis. Very interestingly, that D-dimer, uh, you know, uh, they followed, uh, there is one study that they followed D-dimer after discharge 90 days, and they found a remarkable, you know, normalization uh, of the D-dimer. Uh, and they found, uh, you know, uh, there is correlation between the higher level of D-dimer, the higher risk of uh, thrombosis. Uh, the last question, maybe not even related unless she has a cancer, regarding pregnant patients and use of uh, DOAC, is there any special consideration? They are not approved. All of them. Not. Well, I think we are approaching the end. Uh, it was really a very nice, uh, excellent presentation from all our speakers. I'd like to thank the uh, SSBD for, for organizing such activity and all the speakers and also uh, appreciate and thank Pfizer for sponsoring uh, this uh, webinar. And uh, this is uh, the site where you can get the YouTube channel for the SSBD if you want to review and somebody you want to uh, listen to this webinar again. And would like to see you in the future for our next uh, um, webinar, which is about challenges in uh, CLL uh, management. And again, thank you for the attendees. Thank you for the speakers. Thank you for Pfizer and thank you SSBD. And we'll see you soon, inshallah. Thank you very much for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.